So again, uh, without further ado, uh, this is the WeGo Smart Health Responder webinar. This is a series and we have three different parts to this. This is the first of the three. So very much of a pleasure to have all of you here with us. The purpose of this series of webinars is to share different measures from around the world, national and local, but also from the private sector and from healthcare professionals in how they have uh, taken measures to, uh, to reduce the impacts of COVID-19. So we're focused on smart health in this, this series of webinars. Uh, it's uh, one of other series that, that we will be releasing from, uh, from WeGo. Um, but today, uh, it's a little bit longer than maybe you're used to if you're familiar with these types of webinars. Two hours. I hope that's not too long for you. Uh, I promise it will be worth it if all of you stick around. Um, today, we're proud to have over 140 different people from around the world, 30 different countries from Europe, the Americas, uh, Middle East, Africa, and Asia, all joining us today, 30 different countries. And we're also broadcasting live. via GoToMeeting, which many of you are on right now, as well as YouTube. So please feel free to join us there. Um, I'm going to just spend a couple minutes um, presenting about WeGo for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, uh, and then we'll get right into it. So I am the program director uh, here at WeGo. Uh, our secretariat is based in Seoul. Uh, our president city is Seoul, and we have several different regional offices around the world. We're an international association and we are comprised of different types of members, the majority of which are cities and other types of local governments around the world, which you can see on the map there with the dots. And as of today, we have 205 different members. And in the last couple of years, we've been growing in uh, corporate membership. So we have a number of different uh, private sector partners, which are uh, providing different innovative smart tech solutions to cities. And we help match make those. And then we also work with national and regional ICT institutions, academic institutions, research organizations, and so on. Uh, we work with a number of different partners uh, around the world, including the UN. We have multilateral development banks like the World Bank and Asian Development Bank and others which, uh, which are also uh, very much involved in smart cities, Smart Cities Council, uh, Smart Cities Institute of Japan, and others, many of whom are joining us today on this webinar. So very good to see you here. Next slide. Today, we're going to be talking about what we call the smart health responder. This is a new framework, uh, obviously born out of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the purpose is to offer uh, our members, as well as partners and stakeholders, different services and support for their uh, actions against COVID-19 so that we can all uh, reduce the impact and uh, Save, uh, ensure safety to citizens around the world as soon as possible. This uh, framework has three different components. Uh, if you go on our website, you can see it uh, in case you haven't already, but it's at the front of our website. You just click Smart Health Responder and it will bring you to this page. You can see a collection of different best practices and these are both national and local uh, initiatives that the governments around the world have taken. We are doing this research in-house here at WeGo and you can see a lot of different cases uh, uh, in a lot of different ways that maybe inspires cities uh, around the world to, um, to approach their own situations in similar ways. So far, we have about 30 of these different cases and they're increasing uh, weekly. We also have a collection of videos and webinars that we uh, both conduct ourselves, but also that we share from around the world with our partners. So you can see all of those that are upcoming as well as the past ones. So if you want to go back into our archive and see what kind of webinars have been done in the area of smart health, this is a great resource for you to go and check that out. And then last but not least, we have a section called need assistance. If you are representing a city or otherwise that is in need of medical supplies that's short on PPEs, personal protective equipment and others, then you can reach out to WeGo and we have a number of partners that we work with that we can try to secure these types of resources for you and your city. So these are, that's the smart health responder in a nutshell. I just wanted to present that as kind of the background for why we're doing all of this. Again, this is a three part series. This is the first, and I'll talk a little bit more about the other two uh, as we near the end of the, the, um, the webinar for today. But I want to first uh, start with our opening remarks. We have a few from uh, different distinguished guests that are with us today. And uh, first, uh, we will have the mayor of Seoul, which is our president of this organization. And uh, he is uh, 
going to be speaking uh, for his city, as well as the mayor of Makati, uh, Mayor Binet. And uh, she is is actually our executive vice president of WIDO. So if without further ado, let's uh, hear the opening remarks from them. Mayor Binay of Makati City. I'm Wonsun Park, Mayor of Seoul and President of WIGO. I'm deeply saddened to see how the COVID-19 pandemic is greatly affecting many cities, causing distress, death, economic losses, and disrupting much of our everyday life. As Mayor of Seoul and President of WIGO, I'd like to send a message of solidarity and support to you and your citizens in this unprecedented time of global crisis. I hope our solid relationship established through years in WIGO can significantly contribute to overcoming this pandemic together. We are now bracing for the long-term impact of an outbreak across the economy, society, and well-being of our citizens. We should be prepared for a great transition to a new normal, this so-called untaxed society triggered by the COVID-19 outbreak. I hope this webinar today will be a great help to enhancing communication among WIGO members and preparing for the post-coronavirus era. While we continue to fight against COVID-19, the situation in Seoul is gradually improving. Seoul launched an online platform, CAC Car Series Against COVID-19 in April to share our COVID-19 countermeasures and know-how with cities around the world. And the CAC Global Summit 2020 will be held virtually from June 1st to June 5. I hope our experiences and lessons we have learned in the past months and the initiative we have taken will be a great support for your city's effort in fighting COVID-19. I strongly believe that our combined and concerted efforts will prevail at the end and we will emerge stronger and better from this crisis. If we can go together, we can do better. Thank you. This thing. Greetings to Mayor Woon Soon Park, Secretary General Kim Yo Lee, fellow WIGO Executive Committee members, participants, observers, and guests. Makati City has been preparing to host the WIGO 2020 General Assembly since last year. Unfortunately, we have been overtaken by the COVID 19 pandemic. We deeply regret having to cancel the General Assembly, which would have allowed me to personally meet and interact with the majority of you. We are all fighting a difficult battle today, one that has already cost the lives of hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. As of this writing, Makati City has 559 COVID-19 positive patients, and we have lost 55 individuals. I know your cities have suffered immeasurably too. I'm not just talking about the financial and economic impacts of COVID-19, but more about the loss of life and the strain the pandemic has caused in our healthcare systems. I consider it apt that our webinar today is entitled Smart Healthy Responder because that is exactly what, must, what we must be. We must be smart solution providers as we put the health and safety of our people front, back, and center. Makati has always been part of its vision to become a smart and digital city way ahead of others in the country. As the heart of business and commerce, we have been preparing for disasters and emergencies for years, but COVID-19 has tested all our best laid plans and strategies. Our first course of action was to lock everything down and keep people indoors to keep the transmission of the virus to a minimum. This hurt Makati tremendously because business and commerce are the lifeblood of our city. I met with city officials and department heads to craft a two-pronged plan. The first was to expand and level up our existing social services programs to cover food rations, financial assistance, delivery of maintenance medicine, and continue providing healthcare services outside the hospital setting. 
We mobilized different departments for the preparation and distribution of food and essential supplies. We prioritized vulnerable groups, such as senior citizens, students, solo parents, differently abled persons, and informal workers in providing relief goods and financial aid. We immediately organized cash relief amounting to 16.7 million pesos for some 8,376 tricycle, GB and pedicab drivers, giving them 2,000 pesos each to tide them over during the first few weeks of the Enhanced Community Quarantine, or ECQ. Financial assistance was also given to some 13,000 differently abled persons and 2,000 single parents and around 78,000 senior citizens. Recently, we granted cash incentives for around 12,000 public school graduates using contactless distribution again via GCash. The second goal was to address the treatment of COVID-19 patients. The Makati Health Department and Hospital ng Makati had to quickly adapt and draft and implement protocols. Initially, our focus was on isolating and treating patients who have tested positive. Their families and co-workers were also monitored for possible infection. They were placed on home quarantine and closely monitored by our healthcare personnel. Phase two was preparing for the huge wave of patients. The Makati Friendship Suites was converted into an isolation facility that could accommodate 100 patients. Barangay Health Center isolation areas were also created to monitor residents who exhibited symptoms. Residents were given a hotline to call and healthcare workers fetched them from their homes and moved them to the monitoring facilities. In addition to Hospital ng Makati, four more emergency quarantine facilities were set up. We also built two well-equipped negative pressure tents with intensive care unit beds, air conditioning, and air purification system. The city's free mass testing is also ongoing to detect, isolate, and treat frontliners and residents who might have contracted the virus. I'm also proud to share that Makati is the first city in the Philippines to use automated and digital distribution of cash aid during the pandemic through the Makati Zen app and the Makati Zen card, an all-purpose ID that can be used for cashless transactions. This is a big step for any LGU because it eliminates the need for residents to leave their homes and queue for assistance. With our cashless distribution, we're able to prevent mass gatherings or clustering of people in one area. Makati City has been working on the Makati Zen project for over two years now, and it has proven useful in this scenario. Our Makati Zen cardholders no longer have to go to City Hall to fill out forms for assistance. They only need to log in to our app or our website and access the help they need. Running a city during a pandemic could very well be impossible, but only if you're doing it alone. I am blessed to have the full trust, support, and cooperation of the city council, department heads, administrators, the business community, private organizations, and the bulk of the city workforce. As of now, we are slowly and carefully reopening important sectors of our city, including offices and establishments. We are confident in the future well remain digital. I am determined to utilize all available resources, including digital technology. Build resilience and enhance capacity. It's up to us to use the protected and ensure the survival of the whole economy. Now more than ever, we must be our people's primary front line. Together, we must fight the unknown and firm commitment to put our people's welfare above all at all times. Thank you. Thank you to Mayor Park and to Mayor Binay for those encouraging words. And it's also uh, very much a great honor and privilege to now welcome our newest city member and the first member from New Zealand in WeGo's network, uh, the city of Wellington. And the mayor, uh, Andy Foster, is here to also deliver his welcome remarks. So please, Mayor Foster. Thank you very much. And uh, can I start by just acknowledging um, Mayor Park uh, and also uh, Mayor Benai for your um, your presentation. Um, look, uh, it's it's great to be able to uh, contribute and to uh, to be with you today. Um, as we know, the COVID nineteen pandemic has created an unprecedented health and economic challenge for cities all around the world. Uh, New Zealand has a a big advantage in that we're a very isolated country and we have a very uh, large amount of water around us, so we can isolate ourselves, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, so on the 25th of March, uh, New Zealand essentially went into lockdown 
and we also stopped essentially any uh, incoming flights other than some repatriation of New Zealand residents. Uh, we turned away tourists uh, and we've quarantined all returning New Zealanders for 14 days in various government facilities. Uh, that being obviously the gesta uh, gestation period for the, uh, the virus. Um, we went into a what we uh, what we have is a four level um, system uh, and we went into what was called level four, which is a lockdown system. So all of our schools, universities, public venues were closed, all non-essential businesses were closed. And as a country, we had a very, very strong message that we all were instructed to essentially go home, to stay home, to stay in what we referred to as bubbles. Uh, and we only went out to exercise and that was done locally. Uh, so you didn't go and drive to exercise uh, or to seek medical treatment or to get supplies. So those are the only three reasons that uh, people would, would go out. Uh, as uh, we had very, very strong hygiene instructions, which were um, voluntary, but everyone I think really behaved exceedingly well uh, in that. Uh, and it was things around staying separate, so keeping keeping uh, separate from other people, uh, staying local, uh, and only going out for the reasons that uh, you needed to, and maintaining various hygiene um, hygiene protocols. Uh, we partnered with central government. We're probably a much more centralised uh, central government. Um, uh, is, very much dominates our system. Uh, local government is a, is a relatively small part of the New Zealand system. Uh, but we partner with central government and non-government agencies to look after our most vulnerable people. Uh, and in fact, we managed to end homelessness during this time, which was quite an achievement uh, in our city. Our chief executive moved very quickly to enable the vast majority of our council staff to work from home in accordance with the government lockdown requirements. Uh, as a council, our key role was to support the government's messaging to make sure that Wellingtonians were aware and would comply with the government health advice. So we shared that government advice across our social media channels and I as mayor held daily video updates to connect with Wellingtonians and provide updates on what the council was doing to help look after uh, our residents. We also, of course, continued to deliver essential services and it was essential services only, things like uh, water, sewage, rubbish uh, and those welfare services. I've got to say it was absolutely fantastic to see how well Wellingtonians did and in fact New Zealanders as a whole did in following government's advice. We have great parks and community spaces in our city and as hard as it was to stay away, our residents did. We all stayed home and we broke the chains of transmission and put ourselves in a great position to get our economy ticking again. Uh, the situation which we're in at the moment is we had 1,504 total cases across the entire country. We had 22 deaths, all of them were older people. I think the youngest was about 62. We, at this stage, we have 1,481 people recovered. And if you uh, do the maths there, you will know that there is one person in the country who is still um, suffering from COVID. And uh, that will obviously finish fairly shortly. So uh, at the moment, we are on track to have no, no people with COVID in the country. We still have people coming into the country, uh, but they will have to go through the quarantine process uh, to, to keep the rest of the country safe. Uh, and so what we're doing now is we're dropping down through the, uh, the alert levels. As I said, we started off in level four, which is complete lockdown. In level three, we were able to open up construction uh, and then moving to level two, we were able to open up things like retail business, but keeping people separate from each other as much as we can. Uh, we hope that we'll be in the lowest level, which is level one uh, within the next uh, month. And then um, from there, go back to almost business as usual within we would hope uh, a few months. Uh, so we are slowly reopening our city, uh, reopening our country. Uh, and I, I want to echo also um, Mayor Binay's um, comment that uh, the post-COVID the post -COVID era will be very, very different to the pre-COVID era. One thing we've certainly learned is how to work from home. Uh, Zoom and webinars have become very familiar territory. And I think I will leave it there. And uh, we're very, very happy and keen to work with you all uh, to uh, be able to share the lessons of how we've been able to deal with the, the COVID-19 situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Foster. Really great to see all the progress that your city as well as your country have been making. I think it's inspirational for us all and great to see you as part of our network. So before we move on to the presentations, I want to uh, allow our Secretary General, Mr. Kyung Yong Lee, to also give a few remarks. Thank you. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. How are you, our uh, Uyghur friends and partners? My special thanks go to uh, His Worship, the Mayor Foster of Wellington. Thank you for uh, joining us live 
and congratulations on the successful virus containment and also on the recent Uyghur membership of your city. I thank Mayor Park of Seoul and Mayor Binai of Makati as well for the beautiful messages. I remain very optimistic too. We are great human beings, so we can solve problems however serious they are. As Persian poet Rumi sang some 700 years ago, the current crisis too shall pass away. The Black Death of the 14th century passed away and the Spanish flu 100 years ago passed away. But the question is how long it will take and how many uh, will fall victim to it. Of course, we want it to go away uh, as fast as we wish and with minimum fatalities. And it depends on how we tackle the challenges and what means we possess to fight it. COVID-19 virus is a very dangerous murderer, but we don't have weapons to kill or disable the virus yet. We need some more time. So what we have to do now is three Ps, precaution, prevention, and preparation for the future. By avoiding the virus for a while, we buy time for the invention of vaccine and medicine, and possibly a novel way of living. Here, transnational collaboration becomes instrumental. We need to put our heads together to save human lives and human civilization. And as Mayor Park said, we should be prepared for a great transition to a new normal. Wego is a smart city organization. As you might have heard me before. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. As you might have heard me before, Smart City is a happy city for smart people, homo sapiens. Smart city means nothing if people are not healthy or happy. So we go launch the Smart Health Responder Program. Many Uyghur events and programs this year have been either postponed or canceled. For some time, we will focus on two tasks. The Smart Health Responder is the one, and the other is called Smart City Driver. It designs your smart city, and you can do it online at your office. I strongly encourage you to uh, look into that. When the virus is gone, we will go for the implementation. For WIGO members, I take this opportunity to announce that our annual executive committee meeting will be online sometime in the fall time. The details will be consulted and notified soon. COVID-19 has a silver lining. It testifies, though in a rather grotesque way, the smart technology and digitalization of government is the key to fast and efficient response. We are witnessing many best practices around the world, early mass testing and sequestration, smart social distancing and smart applications, online education and digital distribution of cash aid in case of Makati City are prominent examples. We need to share those knowledges and policies to make people healthy and happy. I also anticipate the CAC, Cities Against COVID-19 Global Summit organized by Seoul online next week. Having said that, I welcome you to the first session of WIGO webinar Health Responder Webinar Series. We'll meet online like this for a while, but I hope we will see you soon in flesh and blood. Please, uh, please stay safe and healthy, and I wish you 10,000 happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you for those remarks, Secretary General Lee. And before we start with the presentations, I just want to remind uh, observers to please turn off your cameras as well as your microphones. 
so that only the speakers are showing right now. So Ms. Joyce and uh, Mr. Venkate Shwaru, if you could please turn off your cameras, uh, that will make it more convenient for those who are observing. We're going to start the first set of presentations uh, from cities. Uh, we will be sharing the experiences of those cities with COVID-19, how it's uh, impacted them and their citizens, what measures the cities have taken to uh, respond to the virus. And we've got some best practice uh, cases from Seoul, Bangkok, and Vladivostok. So uh, let's start with Dr. Pek Jun Na. He is the Director General for the Citizens Health Bureau of Seoul Metropolitan Government. And he also is the Director of Sobuk Hospital, which is run by the city government. And he also works with the Korea Society for Preventive Medicine. We will begin with Dr. Na for his presentation on Seoul. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank you, Wigo, for inviting me as a speaker to share Seoul's rapid response and preparedness toward COVID-19. Seoul is committed to sharing our experience and knowledge with you. And through this opportunity, I hope the insight and lessons Seoul has learned will be of some assistance to you. Uh, Seoul's principle for contagious disease control and prevention rests on two major pillars, promptness and transparency. The city of Seoul, under the leadership of Mayor Won Sun Park, has adhered to the principle transparency is a miracle drug for contagious disease, and excessive response is better than a sluggish response. Next. Uh, Seoul and Korea have kept on testing aggressively, sharing information and focusing on disinfection. A series of steps, including patient testing, epidemiologic investigation, and quarantine has been reinforced and carefully repeated, preventing any source of infection in advance. This has enabled Seoul to maintain urban services and functions without any lockdown or stay at home, although while practicing its containment effort. Uh, all the information related to COVID-19 has been open to the public and shared in a transparent manner. The COVID-19 webpage, which is, is on the official website of the Seoul Metropolitan Government, provides updates on confirmed cases within the city, uh, their triple logs, and the relevant resources along with the city's countermeasures. A clean zone, mm, yes, Seoul has been attaching clean zone certifica certification stickers to facilities visited by COVID-19 confirmed cases that have been fully disinfected to show that they are safe. Once the government completes a thorough disinfection and designates a facility as a clean job, citizens can see which facilities are now safe to visit. These clean job stickers and banners are being used in effort to recover the withering economy and resolve the immeasurable anxiety surrounding the matter. Seoul has been undertaking rigorous measures to track those who have been in contact with confirmed patients using credit card transaction, emergency text messages, and the CCTV recordings. Their locations are published on Seoul's COVID-19 website and the close contact identified through investigations are put under self-quarantine and monitored by staff of the government. As a response to the increasing mask demand and price, the Korean government decided to distribute the facial masks uh, through public channels. Since March uh, 9th, citizens have been able to purchase two masks weekly on designated days of the week. Depending on the last digit of the purchases year of birth, uh, this ration has now been increased to three masks a week. 
to relieve the pain of the residents whose livelihood have been jeopardized by COVID-19, Seoul decided on March 18th to provide to an emergency livelihood no, no. allow us no. to this is 100% of the median income. The amount of the emergency livelihood assistance is between uh, US dollar uh, 233 uh, uh, to 389 and varies depending on the number of household members. The funds are dis dispersed in the form of community gift certificates or prepaid cards in order to stimulate the local economy and the beneficiary are allowed to choose between them. Contrary to hopes that the number of cases would continue to be zero, the current ET1 club group infection has kept Seoul and Korea on the guard for future secondary cases. As a result, Seoul has been enforcing stricter rules and regulations in terms of preparing for the second wave of, of the pandemic. Just like we have been doing, we track the contacts of people who visited the same facility as those who were infected. A through credit card transaction and list of names and contact information that clubs and bars required visitors to fill out upon entry. Speci specifically, we customized text messages to those who were found to be at the facilities at the time, encouraging them to get tested for free and anonymously. As a strict measure, so also announced the people who do not voluntarily get tested when they should could be subject to a fine of up to 20 million won. From lessons learned through the COVID-19 pandemic, Seoul is preparing for a second wave that may hit us again this year. As well as the, for future pandemics, during last week's corona briefing, Mayor Park announced the establishment of a Seoul standard preventive measure model for epidemics. Seoul is planning to implement this framework in preparing for and controlling future pandemics. The three main plans to build the Seoul standard preventive measure model for epidemics are as follows. One, strengthen infrastructure and the groundwork in responding to outbreaks of infectious disease on the local government level. Two, build up on medical resources for preventive measure against the epidemic. Three, establish a response system in preparation for a second wave of the pandemic. Seoul will be carrying out this plan by implementing the following. Seoul will subdivide the infectious disease response level to seven levels, adding three more levels to the existing national scale. This will help to break down the seriousness of pandemics in more detailed and comprehensive manners. We will strengthen the function of disease surveillance control tower by newly establishing a research center for infectious disease and the epidemiological invest investigation office. Uh, we will uh, innovate and strengthen our public health system and the services such as reorganizing the functions of our municipal hospital. Seoul will drastically expand on its public health workforce to provide better uh, public health services and respond more efficiently to pandemics. We will build Seoul's ARC, an integrated warehouse to stock up disaster management resources. Moreover, Seoul will expand on the and strengthen the function of designated public clinics in preparation for the second wave. The rapid, innovative, and transparent preventive measure that Seoul took together with the systemized citizens' participation was what made Seoul an exemplary case in preventing the spread of COVID-19. Now, Seoul is preparing for the 
post-corona era through the aforementioned Seoul Standard Prevention, a preventive measure model for epidemics. Seoul strives to become a world standard city for infectious disease response through its accumulated experience in fighting the MERS uh, and the current COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. La. And just for those observers, uh, happy to see over 80 on GoToMeeting. I'm sure we have more on YouTube Live. If you have questions, we'll be taking them after the third speaker. Uh, if GoToMeeting is your platform and you're not familiar with the interface, if you go to the top right, there is a speech bubble. If you click that, that's the chat room and you can leave your questions here. Our officers will be scanning those for questions and we'll be choosing the, the appropriate ones for the Q&A session. So without further ado, I would now like to invite Dr. Metipo Chapa Metipun. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, the cases from his city of Bangkok. He is working as the director for the Communicable Disease Control Division, and that is the uh, under the public health department of the city. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Metipun. Good afternoon to our members, Miko. Uh, we are now in the midst of the major coronavirus disease, COVID-19 epidemic. This country faces various problems in both health and economy issues. I am Dr. Medipot Shata Medikun, Director of the Communicable Disease Control Division, Health Department, Bangkok Metropolitan Administration, as a representative of BMA in presenting the methods the, of BMA has to deal with this COVID-19 crisis, which are running experience, exchanging with all the city that attended this meeting. Locations of COVID-19 disease in Bangkok, like many cities, named caused by imported coronavirus cause a uh, place from Wuhan, the capital city of Hebei province, Republic of China, and began to spread from other cities of China and other countries with continuously increasing epidemic in which Bangkok is the first city that has epidemic in Thailand. Subsequent epidemic began in Bangkok population with the highest epidemic during March and April 2020, until Thailand government announced the cultures of the coast country in and out in late uh, March. Epidemic during this period were 100 to 200 people per day. Bangkok Metropolitan Administration urged to investigate the disease from patient to find out close contact and collect specimen from the days five to seven after contacting the patient and required to observe the symptom in case without infection for a 14 days home quarantine. If 14 days, if infected with COVID-19 will be sent to receive the treatment at all in the hospital. Bangkok Metropolitan Administration has developed the BKK COVID-19 application in which an application to help screening, educate, and help people to receive advice and treatment correctly. And instantly, which people can do this assessment by themselves on the website bkkcovid19.bangkok.go.th so that all people can access, uh, their, access their symptoms immediately and there will be staff to call to inquire about the history and symptom, including the symptoms such as sore throat, cough, running nose, fever, tiredness, and history data, such as uh, cause COVID-19 patients contact, working with tourists, working 
in a crowded place, working in an establishment that had an epidemic. If there are no symptoms, no history will be classified in teen group, such as wearing masks, masks, and refrain from going to the community. If there is at least one symptom, and if there are no history, the people will be classified in yellow group, suggesting to observe the symptom wearing, wearing a mask and refrain to refrain from going to the community. If the symptom is not disappear, uh, is this recommend to college the specimen? If having symptom and history is classified into orange group, it is recommended to specimen collection. And if there is wheezing, it will be classified into red group. BMA will send an ambulance to pick up the patient and bring them to the hospital. For specimen collection service, BMA has provided specimen collection service area near the risky place with a specimen collection mobile unit moving into the risk community. The test result will be known in the next day. If negative result, such as home quarantine for 14 days, or if a positive result, there will be an emergency ambulance to pick up patients and bring them to the hospital. Furthermore, there will be an investigation to find out patient under investigation until everyone who is exported to high risk has negative result. In addition, the home quarantine also has communicable disease control officer. This officer, public health volunteer, to visit them at home, to assess the condition at home quarantine people. If not, it will be sent to the local quarantine in Bangkok, and staff will monitor them to self-quarantine for a total of 14 days. Do not go out and have document to check the symptom every day, morning and evening. If there is fever or respiratory symptom and uh, ambulance to pick up and bring them to check COVID-19 at the hospital. In addition, in our establishment, every community has health volunteer and establishment in which staff test fever and check for respiratory symptoms every time entering the community. If uh, abnormal, we will notify the hospital immediately. Incorporation of the application BKK COVID-19. They are self-assessment. 17,826 people found in equal to 48,139 yellow people, equal to 14,915 orange people, equal to 10,800 red people, equal to 1,900 people using the application. It is one of the people choice that make accessing the system, the service system easier, faster, and finding people with coronavirus disease faster. Finally, I hope that our city will be able to overcome the outbreak of the disease altogether as soon as possible. Thank you for your attention.
matter. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Good evening. Because in Russia, in uh, Vladivostok now, uh, is evening now. So, hello everyone. I want to tell you about uh, experience of Vladivostok uh, on digital life in self-isolation and quarantine uh, because COVID-19 pandemic uh, in Russia now growing and growing. And uh, everybody work in self-isolation. I am now in my apartment and uh, we are working distantly uh, with everybody. Uh, first of all, I should uh, show you, uh, please, next slide. Uh, okay, uh, I want to show you the location of Vladivostok. Uh, Vladivostok is the capital of Russia, Far East Federal District. Uh, if you look on this map, uh, you could find that uh, Russian... Uh, Far Eastern Federal District, it's uh, almost third part of uh, all Russia. And Vladivostok, located on the south of this region, uh, marked by uh, red color. Here are the headquarters of the representative of the president of Russian Federation, uh, and located all ministries of the country, and the largest uh, Far Eastern Federal University, uh, this is the biggest uh, university in Russia. Vladivostok uh, was the first uh, Russian city completely rebuilt uh, its digital management and online, online activity under the strict quarantine against coronavirus COVID-19. Next, please. Uh, we are working uh, now with many digital programs uh, and Vladivostok, uh, uh, the leading city in uh, Russia, uh, working with uh, uh, digital uh, programs. Next, please. Uh, the, first, uh, the first program, uh, the name of the first program, uh, We Are Together. Uh, we Are Together, this is... Uh, all Russian uh, movement and uh, Vladivostok, uh, a center of this mo movement on the Russian Far East. Uh, mutual assistance section, we are together, works for the supporting elderly, disabled ci citizens, and medical staff during the coronavirus pandemic. Volunteers work in all regions of Russia, delivering uh, medicines and products. Lawyers and physicians give free advice to those who need of their help, and thousands of participants of the We Are Together help uh, with their services and goods. The pro these programs, We Are Together, also work for assistance to compatriots, uh, Russian compatriots who are abroad now and uh, who want uh, to return to native country. Currently, export flights are being organized for Russian citizens who are ready to return to their homeland. Often people stay in different countries due to the fact that they are not taken on the flights to cities that do not coincide with the place of registration. If somebody finds himself in this situation, the program We Are Together helps him to get on the next flight to Russia and return home. Next, please. Uh, another uh, all Russia uh, program, uh, the name of this program, V. This is Russian public movement 
uh, that is a di digital action that allows NGOs to participate at Russian governmental project digital economy. Uh, we movement combined many aspects of activities into the viral life of uh, Russia and whole world, virtual life. Public movement, we united leaders and the activists of various NGOs, active and caring people for creation, socially significant events on the platform. Best projects of we digital movement receive grants of Russian government and president of Russia. Next, please. Uh, uh, one more uh, project that we use in Vladivostok, this is a platform for diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19 uh, with using of uh, Eastern medicine methods. Uh, the author of this uh, platform, the Institute of Automation and Control Processes of the Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, that made together with Chinese universities, uh, and uh, they created artificial intelligence platform for diagnosis and treatment of coronavirus uh, with using Eastern medicine methods. This platform works in English, Russian, and Chinese. Uh, now, uh, platform uh, was uh, rebuilt and added by uh, Eastern medicine Western medicine uh, methods. So now it's work uh, on the basis of Eastern medicine and uh, also by Western medicine. Uh, a lot of Chinese hospitals and some hospitals in Europe use this platform for their uh, practice. Next, please. Uh, also, Vladivostok created. Uh, very interesting uh, from our point of view, uh, digital project for uh, foreign countries, mainly for the countries of Asia Pacific. Uh, this project differ from various similar projects by their multilinguistic option. All these projects do not use English as international language for communication among the project participants. These projects use artificial intelligence translators to communicate. All participants communicate in their native language, and artificial intelligence automatically translates their communication online. We believe that the future on the internet is not in the reusing of English language as a Intermedi intermediate communicator tool, but it's the future in the simultaneous translation of artificial intelligence. Now, uh, we live in the era of uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, artificial intelligence could, could help us to avoid uh, necessity uh, to know an uh, intermediate language which we use English uh, for it. Please next slide. Uh, so the first uh, the first such uh, project this is multilingual coronavirus patient psychological support project. The name of this project mutual empathy. This is the first multilingual project that combined different national messengers with automatic translation into their native language. The person who wants to convey his empathy, sympathy and support to another person can communicate with him in his native language. It gives everybody chance even being in another country and not knowing any foreign language or English language as international. Mutual empathy session can be conducted online or by telephone. 
Mutual impasse groups can be used in Kakao Talk, WeChat, Line, Skype, WhatsApp, Facebook. Uh, program also use multi-language platform LARC. Uh, LARC is a new kind of uh, compassionate care for chronic uh, diseases. LARC uses the power of artificial intelligence and proven cognitive behavior therapy to drive behavior changes that help people manage or avoid costly chronic conditions. Next, please. Apologies for interrupting, but uh, just so yeah. that we can make sure that we are on time, there's a, one speaker who must uh, actually leave us in a few minutes. If you could please wrap up in the next minute. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, I don't uh, speak uh, because we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, programs. I just show you and if somebody wants uh, to receive information, uh, you can uh, write me and uh, we will send you description of these projects. Uh, but uh, for us, uh, very important that uh, <clears throat> in uh, uh, next month, uh, we will take part in the video conference World Artificial Intelligence in Healthcare uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, this conference will, will be in ju July and you can could find uh, uh, registration on the website of uh, IMEC, International Medical Change and Cooperation Committee. If you need help, uh, I can help you also. And very important suggestion to discuss Northeast Asia Pacific smart cities. Vladivostok proposed to hold a conference for launching of smart, smart cities association of the Northeast Asia Pacific region. Vladivostok could be a host of this conference at the end of 2020 or at the beginning of 2021. Vladivostok also suggests to organize an online video conference to prepare organizing conference of smart cities uh, association of the Northeast Asia Pacific region at this summer. So you can contact us uh, if you look on this uh, slide, uh, here is the email and uh, our website. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mr. Fersch. And apologies to you as I, right before you were supposed to speak, okay. uh, I lost my connection, but uh, okay. you were very much on the ball. So uh, for those of you who missed it, uh, Mr. Fersch is a member of the city council working for Digital Vladivostok. He also advises the CIO of the city and has also worked with the World Health Organization for the Global Foodborne Infections Network, as well as the Health Promoting Hospitals Network. So very much a pleasure to have you on this webinar. And I have one question for Dr. Na, who also gives his apologies to uh, all of our audience as he must leave a little bit short today, but we have time for one question for him. And uh, this is from the audience. Uh, obviously, one of the reasons Seoul has been able to do so well with uh, responding to COVID-19 in this city is with all of the uh, partnerships that it has had both with the private sector uh, in collecting data and also sharing it. So the concern or the question from the audience is how has Seoul managed to balance the interests of uh, the public in terms of privacy with the interests of the city to keep its citizens safe? Yeah, good. Uh, I want to speak uh, in Korean. Yeah, she uh, translated uh, my word. Ah, uh, 그 정보는 법에 의해서 이 정보를 다 얻었고, 그리고 이거는 굉장히 그 제한된 범위에서 꼭그 필요한 부분에서만 쓰였습니다. 그리고 쓰이고 나서는 다 아, 폐기를 했고요. 어, 하지만 이제 초반에 약간의 그 어떤 누출이 있어서. 어, 개인의 어떤 피해가 있었긴 했습니다만은 그런 부분들을 다 붙잡아 가지고 지금은 어느 정도 그 어떤 밸런스를 가지고 있다고 생각합니다. 그 과정에서 시민들이 그 사생활 침해에 대해서 굉장히 많은 관심을 가졌고 그러지 않도록 저희들한테 계속 널, 어, 가, 여기 감시를 했다는 것도 말씀드립니다. Uh, so to just translate what he has just said, there have been citizen complaints and public discussion regarding privacy issues. However, the government of Korea under national emergency situations 
access citizens' personal information within the government's legal framework and therefore did not release or share this info with third parties. Moreover, personal information accessed have been completely deleted after a period of four weeks. There were a few cases in the early stages of COVID-19 where some citizens' personal information were published without the permission of the government, but by specific media companies and the mishandling of certain public workers. For these cases, the government of Seoul made sure to reprimand and correct these cases, in certain, in certain cases to find them. Currently, these problems have been more strictly regulated, and the government of Seoul is now finding a healthy balance between protecting privacy and making sure the country is safe. Thank you, Dr. Na, and thank you for uh, making it to this webinar despite your busy schedule. Uh, I have another question from the audience. Uh, maybe this one can go to Dr. Mehdi Pot. Um, you were talking a lot about your BKK uh, COVID website, which uh, has some impressive uh, achievements. Um, what about the next phase? What do you have planned for the second wave, which we are all expecting? Okay, uh, in, in Bangkok, uh, now we we do the uh, Salewa Centennial uh, Surveillance for prepare the second wave of uh, COVID-19. And we think uh, uh, we in Bangkok, we have uh, asymptomatic uh, infection, maybe about uh, two, two point, uh, zero, uh, zero, sorry, uh, zero point zero one percent of the asymptomatic patient in Bangkok, and we will do the uh, saliva uh, sentinel surveillance for every uh, every group of the the the, the people that has a uh, leaks for for infection. Thank you, Dr. Metifold. And maybe a question for me to Mr. Fersh. It's quite interesting to see uh, what you are doing with Eastern medicine. I wasn't uh, aware that uh, Russia was so involved in that. So for this uh, platform that you have uh, that is researching with China into Eastern medicine uh, to combat COVID-19, what has the progress looked like? Where have you gotten with this? Uh, is there anything that Russia is contributing to this uh, directly? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, this platform uh, was constructed by uh, by Russian scientists, uh, uh, by sci researchers from Academy of Sciences, on the base of recommendations that we received from Ministry of Health of China, uh, Department of uh, Traditional Medicine. Uh, they have a special uh, recommendation how to use uh, Chinese uh, traditional medicine for uh, diagnosis and uh, how to use traditional Ch Chinese medicine uh, remedies uh, for treatment of COVID-19. Uh, we received it uh, in February uh, of this uh, year and we develop it, uh, we put it on uh, our artificial intelligence platform uh, and open access for everybody who want to use it. Uh, and uh, immediately in uh, March in, and in April, we receive approximately 1,000 of users uh, who uh, implement uh, this uh, platform recommendations for their treatment. Uh, again, I could tell you that uh, it used not only in Russia uh, and in China also. Uh, this is a good example of cooperation of Russian and Chinese uh, researchers uh, on the base of traditional medicine. But uh, now in China situation uh, uh, with coronavirus uh, much more better than in Russia, therefore uh, now uh, we are working mainly with uh, Western medicine uh, uh, recommendations. Okay. Excellent. 
And also uh, very exciting to be working with you and your city for the establishment of the Northeast Asia Smart Cities Network. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that, WIGO will be also launching an online pre-workshop uh, for this initiative uh, in the coming months. So please keep your eyes peeled for that. I think there's a lot of interesting developments that will be happening. So thank you once again to all of our speakers, to Dr. Na, to Dr. Metipot, and to Mr. Fersht. Uh, if I may, I'd like to go on to the next uh, session of presentations. We're going to move from city examples to now how the private sector has stepped in to assist cities in their response, particularly with cases from Italy and Bulgaria. And we're also going to have some insight from the medical community on how to prepare, to prepare for further waves that the whole world is expecting right now. So we will start with Italy uh, with Dr. I'm sorry. One moment, please. Uh, I also want to check just before I, I move away from this, uh, this session. Uh, it's actually very much a pleasure, I think, that we have on uh, in the audience, uh, Mr. Rudy Sal. He is the deputy mayor of Nice in France. Uh, if you are here, deputy mayor, uh, maybe uh, I want to give the floor to you so that you have an opportunity to ask uh, one of the speakers or all of the speakers a question as you wish. Are you here? Mr. Sa? Seems not to be the case. So uh, we will go ahead then. Uh, and if he joins us later, then perhaps uh, he can ask uh, the next uh, speakers something. Uh, I would like to start with Dr. Lanfranco Marasso. He's the Smart City Program Director uh, of Engineering, which is Ingeniera Informatica. And uh, he will be telling us uh, about um, cases from his company. And he is the chairman uh, of the Task Force on Smart Cities for the Big Data Value Association and also for working groups of the European Cybersecurity Organization and the Alliance for Internet of Things Innovation. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Marasso, please go ahead. Thank you very much to everyone and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today, I want to share with you what, uh, what happened in Italy and how we support the Italian government, the Italian regional governments in uh, approaching the, the, the crisis. And the title of my presentation is uh, Can Data Save Lives? Yes, of course, the medical doctors are in the front line, but we can also provide our contribution from the technical side. So we are living a nightmare in a uh, global. And what is the situation in Italy right now? Well, we are reopened the country, but uh, we must be very prudent and we must be careful about this. Just to give you a few numbers, Italy is about uh, 60 million person and uh, we suffer a number like uh, more than 200,000 people cases and uh, more than 30,000 people die. So uh, probably is the most, most affected area in the world, at least in Europe. And we started at the beginning of the story working with uh, some regional governments because the regional governments is uh, responsible for health. And this is the worldwide famous curve. So we are now going down. So um, let, me, let me share a few things. The challenges we approach with the government uh, basically started trying to stop the contagion and trying to, try to lower the death and uh, to, to protect people working in the hospital and try to create, uh, which are the point where we are now facing to the new normality as we used to call it and facing to uh, expecting and waiting for the, for the next wave, hopefully not, but that this is the case. And we need to understand how can we reopen uh, the, the, our country. So the, the, the first point is uh, social distancing, which is, which is important. I, I, I mentioned in my previous slide a point where we close the country with a lockdown and uh, the, we benefit in the weeks later about the uh, flattening the curve in this way. But of course, we need also to monitor, and this is the role of uh, technology and IT. And uh, we work closely to the medical doctor because we, we, we know we are only uh, engineers and we, we can provide any, any kind of things. And this is a matter of to be an ecosystem with the different skills working together and trying to, to take care about this uh, huge uh, war against the virus. 
So uh, basically the point has been to locate the, 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 the positive subjects and try to identify as soon as possible the clusters of infections and try to identify in the map what will happen nearby and try to, 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 to predict the evolution of the, of the pandemic. So we create uh, we actually create the government and an ecosystem, including institutions, hospitals, central healthcare practitioners, everyone able to uh, contribute with skills and knowledge in finding the virus. And this was exactly what we did, uh, creating in few days, really in few days, I'll explain as we did uh, in, in a way, uh, a bio-surveillance system because we didn't reinvent the wheel. We just use information available in the government and in the healthcare authorities. And uh, basically the, the bio-surveillance system uh, create a kind of real-time geolocation system um, and try to understand what about the, the pandemic and the predict the contagion and the, to remotely so, um, uh, provide <clears throat> uh, healthcare system to the, to the patients. And uh, this is basically the way, thanks to the technology, in the background, there is Fineware, which is an open standard uh, platform providing open source component. And a uh, few years ago, we started developing a product which is called Digital Enable, which is a platform. And every platform, and the job of the platform is to make, make together, make together uh, different information from different sources. So in few days, uh, the, on the on the left hand side, where is my iPad, where I sketch the, the wishing list of the medical doctor. And on the right hand side, you can see what we did in a few days, providing to the medical doctor a dashboard and to the task force a dashboard, and, uh, which is now used by thousands and thousands of doctors uh, taking care about, about the infection in, in, uh, in, the, in the area. What is this? Uh, this is basically a biosurveillance in order to take under control the, the, the very critical information. Uh, we define uh, a, um, users uh, a, having the, the credential to access to the data. I'll mention later the issues related to the privacy, but uh, this platform is used by only the government. Any single information is public for everyone. And we are able to define the the profile for the infected people and to build the network, the social network, the people infected, the family living together and the neighbors in the same building on the same street. So in this way, we can take under control the evolution of the pandemic. So this is basically what we did. All this kind, all these box in the bottom are the existing information for the government, but we are closing to the silos and we need to open the silos because only the combination of information can be a value for the medical doctor. And thanks to the, to the, to the digital neighbor, we combine the information and we release back these kind of things. Let me share only a few things. We started collecting data from the micro labs with all the tests. And uh, at the beginning of the story, end of February, when the first case appeared on stage, uh, we update the system twice a day. Now, uh, with only two labs. Now I'm talking about a region with more than 15 million people, uh, which is the 10th country in Europe, just to give me uh, an idea about the size that we are supporting. And uh, we are now, every hour, collect data from 20 different uh, labs. And thanks to this data, we are able to predict the information about the evolution of the pandemic. And this was very useful in order to predict when the people, when the peak of the epidemic uh, will be and uh, how many people will be affected and how many beds in intensive care must be planned with temporary hospitals. And based on the fact we measure all the data daily or I mean hourly, uh, the data are very precise in order to predict where are now and we are now in a position to know exactly on the map where the people are used to live. I'm not tracking the people with mobile application. I'm just tracking the people where are used to live. 
And in this way, I can know where, where how many people are living together and what about the neighbors. And uh, I can receive all, all the information if you are living at home in quarantine or if, if you are in hospital or if you are in intensive care. But now the challenge, since we are opening the country based on the information, we need to look about the new normality or the, the words we are used to, to have. And the challenge is to have an early warning on new cluster of infection. And we define an algorithm, an index, which is our invention, let me say, where we are able, based on the data which are collected on the field, to predict how would happen now if you have new clusters based on the last three days, and uh, if uh, a new cluster is increasingly fastly or not, or if you are decreasing. And this is important. Let me close my presentation uh, in order the security aspect. Every single information is managed under the control of the central government, because anyone is allowed to have so critical and sensible information. But the combination of information is very useful for the medical doctor in order to protect his or her patients, to the hospitals, in order to protect the, the doctors, in order to protect everyone being in touch with the COVID hospitals. And the third, the information are related to the, to the government task force, so they can plan every single actions on the field. I'll try to reduce in 10 minutes my presentation, but of course, uh, you have a long presentation, which is available for we got for everyone, and I'm very happy to share with you because this is not a matter of my solution or your solution. This is a matter to share solution, and the, and this solution really saved thousands of lives in the net in the last two months. Thank you so much, and I'm fully available to contribute to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Marasso, and it's great to see you working together with Fireware Foundation. That's also one of WeGo's partners. Good to see that they are involved in this fight. Uh, moving on to the next presentation, we have Mr. Chris Georg Georgiev. He is uh, from uh, Bulgaria, uh, CEO of Imaga, and he's a board member of the Startup Foundation, the first entrepreneurial organization in Bulgaria, and that has over 200 startup events in the last decade. And he's also the co-founder of Sticky Creative, which is a social media marketing agency. So the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I'm Chris, and I'm currently based in Seoul, South Korea. So uh, yeah, same time zone as uh, the organizers. So I'm here to uh, present our new project called Kelvin Health. And um, it's a non-invasive solution for daily monitoring and detection of early signs of inflammation or other misbalances in your body. Uh, Kelvin registers these changes in your body temperature before there are any visible symptoms. Can you change next slide? Yeah, and next. Okay, so Kevin is a uh, cross-field uh, innovation between uh, medical science, uh, thermography and AI. It's a very easy off-the-shelf solution for health monitoring based on the, our powerful AI analysis that happens either on the device or in the clouds. Uh, it's not invasive methods, contrary to some other medical imaging approaches that can be in, um, invasive and damaging to human bodies, X-ray. It's designed to be used at home. The data we collect is anonymized and uh, is used to improve our algorithms. Next slide. So this is how it works. You have a thermal camera attached to your mobile phone. Uh, for better precision, the picture needs to be taken several times a day uh, of your upper body and preferably after removing clothing. Next slide. Then we perform AI analysis of the actual thermal image by analyzing different zones of uh, your body. These are specific points of interest that um, uh, and uh, any differences in the appearances from a typical healthy individual. The AI then detects the different discrepancies and uh, specific correlations or lack of such. Next slide. 
Uh, so the extracted data is then processed via our um, medical algorithm and then cross-validated with what our AI imaging has identified. Eventually, we can detect anomalies and alert the user uh, so she or he can take specific measures in addressing that issue. Um, these anomalies are visible from the thermal picture analysis way before the immune system kicks in with the overall increase of the body temperature. And that's actually very beneficial because uh, um, uh, what happens with the most uh, currently used thermal cameras right now, um, they just uh, register the um, uh, overall body temperature. Next slide. So uh, Kelvin Health conclusions are preliminary. We do not pretend to come up with a medical diagnosis. Uh, Kelvin Health is an assisting and monitoring device that can help you and your medical doctor to better understand your health status. Next slide. Currently, we deliver a, a Kelvin Health solution to a mobile application. Uh, it allows you to take thermal images. Uh, you can set demographics. Um, you can set specific current health conditions if you have any. You can also set alerts reminding you to take thermal images several times a day in the specific times designated. And also you can opt in to send data to your medical doctor. The application is currently available on uh, iOS test flights uh, in our uh, uh, beta version and soon will be released on both iOS and Android. Next slide. So both the use case in the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic situation there are very target groups that need to be monitored. It can be confirmed COVID-19 cases, but with no severe symptoms or people with, uh, let's say, direct contact with confirmed cases that are hopefully asymptomatic or um, currently with negative COVID-19 test results. In both cases, there is a possibility to isolate uh, and treat these people at their homes. So we need to know if they are developing complications before it's too late. So Kelvin Health AI can detect uh, specific for COVID-19 inflammations one to three days before developing showing symptoms. Um, as we all know, early detection uh, and isolation of asymptomatic uh, cases is of crucial significance to cut the spread of the coronavirus. Next slide. Of course, our approach is also applicable to people in risk groups, such as people with diabetes, people with uh, senior age or other chronic diseases that might affect their immune system uh, of their body. Application of Kelvin Health is not limited only to a current pandemic situation. Same approach can be proven very beneficial for respiratory disease, as well for vascular disease, and uh, last but not uh, least for oncology cancer. We're currently actively working on a, a, breast, a breast cancer case with a leading international uh, cancer pharmaceutical company. Next slide. Social and uh, healthcare system benefits are pretty significant, I can say. Um, thanks to Kelvin Head, the eventual death of people that might develop complications can be prevented. Indirectly, the effect can be uh, in reduction of healthcare costs by minimizing the number of people who need to be hospitalized. And uh, last but not least, various types of conditions can be prevented based on the monitoring uh, concluded via Kelvin Health, uh, resulting in minimizing the effect of businesses in cases of uh, cluster infections. Next slide. So the non-invasive approach is very useful for monitoring of uh, health conditions of, let's say, public workers. Uh, for example, in transportation services, culture and tourism, elderly care, and nursing homes. The early detection of possible infection process can indicate a developing cluster and give more time for taking prevention measures. As we know, uh, it's like a, a measure of time a matter of time uh, to cut the spread in the cluster and we're experiencing a couple of those right now. And so uh, one in Ituan and the current one with um, Kopang um, Distribution Center. So um, Kelvin is not medical test for, is not a medical test for a viral infection, but it can be very 
early alert for development of such kind of infections. It may, um, it's way more uh, sophisticated than the public uh, thermal imaging screening that's, uh, that only def uh, detects the overall temperature rise. Next slide. So what keeps us uh, busy now? At the very beginning of the project, uh, we started uh, correlating thermal with X-ray imaging. And we trained um, quite big um, image cluster that uh, validated our assumptions uh, about um, COVID-19 being visible and being able to detect uh, through thermal images. Then we focused on the actual thermal imaging analysis and uh, developed our AI algorithms to be able to detect these uh, changes in the respiratory tract due to COVID-19 infection. Uh, well, we're currently working on both iOS and uh, Android uh, version of the application. And at the same time, we're conducting multiple medical trials for COVID-19 and breast cancer conditions. We also nego negotiating with uh, various thermal imaging camera providers as we want to provide the end user and also public bodies who might be interested in utilizing um, our solution with affordable thermal cameras that are calibrated to uh, our Kelvin health solution. We're also in process of uh, identifying possible funding sources to help us speed up the commercialization of our project. Next slide. So our focus right now is on uh, finishing the, uh, the medical trials with the huge help of our test users. The data collected will help us to improve our AI algorithm and fine tune our outcomes uh, of the machine learning analysis. And we're actively working of closing a partnership with the thermal camera manufacturer, as I mentioned before, to lower the, the price of the final uh, Kelvin monitoring set. And we're looking to partner with government and public bodies interested in uh, implementing Kelvin Health solution in their fight with COVID-19. Next slide. So um, Kelvin Health actually is a spin of uh, Imaga, uh, which I'm part of, one of the founders. It's one of the pioneers in the image analysis uh, uh, recognition space. And we've trained one of the biggest air classifiers in the world that recognizes plants uh, for a, a company called PlantSnap. Also, I um, take part in the, um, a program uh, sponsored by Korean government here in Korea for encouraging uh, international uh, tech companies to come and um, do business in Korea called KSR Brand Challenge. And we were like um, participants in the inaugural uh, edition of uh, uh, this competition. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, next slide. This is our team, uh, Kelvin Health team. It's uh, actually a great mix of AI, AI, AI talent and medical specialists with a proven track record in their fields of uh, expertise. And the next slide. Thank you very much uh, for the time. And uh, if you have any questions or any suggestions, or any partnership ideas, uh, please email me at info at kelvin.health or um, yeah, just talk to me later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Georgia. Uh, again, uh, questions will be taken from the audience at any time. So please feel free to leave them here in GoToMeeting or on YouTube and we'll be adding those questions uh, at the end. Um, so we've heard from cities on different cases from local government, We've heard from the private sector for how they've been offering solutions uh, that can be used by local government. And now, obviously, no discussion on this issue could be complete without some uh, advice from the medical community. So we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Ogan Gurel. He is the chief medical officer of Somogen, which is a division of Macrogen. Uh, he is also a visiting professor at Daegu Kyungbuk. Institute of Science and Technology, which is here in Korea. And he's also the Chief Scientific Officer for Field Robot Technology. So the floor is yours, Dr. Guru. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to WeGo for hosting. Uh, I will uh, go very quickly. There's a lot of material. It's uh, uh, to cover on the medical side. So I appreciate this opportunity. 
So I want to answer a few questions uh, through this course of this uh, presentation. First is, what do we know about the virus? Second is, how can we stop it? How does it cause disease? What are the prospects for a vaccine? Can one be reinfected? How does one test for COVID-19? Do antibody tests work? Does the virus mutate? Are effective ant antivirals possible? And other questions. So a lot of material. I apologize if I'm going very quickly. So fasten your seatbelts and uh, uh, we'll move forward. First of all, I should mention uh, that we don't have all the knowledge. Most of you are familiar. This is a very strange virus, uh, lots of unusual behavior. We're learning things every day. And so while there's a phrase attributed to Sir Francis Bacon, the founder of science, the scientific me method, if you will, knowledge is power. Of course, we don't have all knowledge. So I would say some knowledge is power. So as an outline, I'll be talking about the virus. I'll be talking about epidemiology, focusing on mortality and transmission, how the virus attacks, how we fight back, how the virus spreads, what is to be done. So first, focusing on the virus. Just by way of background, what is a virus? A virus is genetic material contained within an organic particle that invades living cells, uses the host machinery to produce new virus particles. So the question is, are viruses alive? And we'll answer that very shortly. This virus has three parts going from the inside to the outside. It has RNA in the inside, nucleic acid. It has a lipid membrane on the outside. And finally, it has a spike protein uh, also on the outside. So this inside RNA is very important because it can mutate and it has implications for immunity and vaccines. This inside of the RNA is what's used for testing in the PCR tests. The lipid has important implications because it determines the environmental viability. So soap and alcohol disrupt this membrane. And thirdly, the spike protein determines the target. It's blocked by antibodies and it's used by other forms of tests, particularly the antigen and the antibody tests. So the question is, are viruses alive? The answer is no. There are only two ways to get rid of the virus. One is to physically destroy it. The second is to have it cleared by the immune system. And this is an important point that I will uh, emphasize later. So in terms of epidemiology, we're going to focus on two parameters, the mortality and the transmission. So this is a chart that shows you the fatality rate on the vertical axis, which I'll highlight in red here, and the transmission or R0 on the horizontal axis, which I'll talk about in green here. In general, there's an inverse relationship between mortality and transmissibility. Many viruses which are very fatal are not very transmissible, so that's up here, and viruses that are not very fatal uh, are quite transmissible. Turns out that the new coronavirus is just in this middle space, in some ways a perfect pathogen. And as you can see, there's the Spanish flu and seasonal flu, which is often compared to. So let's make that comparison, again, in terms of mortality and transmissibility. In terms of mortality, or rather the, the uh, virulence of the virus, COVID-19 is about 10 times greater in terms of hospitalization and also an order of magnitude in terms of case fatality. In terms of transmissibility compared to seasonal flu, the R0 or how many people are infected by one person is also significantly greater than the uh, seasonal flu. And very importantly, and many of the uh, groups and the mayors and other people have been talking about the long transmissibility period the incubation time being about two weeks. Some data suggests that there are different numbers as this uh, situation evolves, but this is roughly the case. So let's talk about how the virus attacks. And we'll focus on this, uh, this part here of the uh, epidemiology. So this is a picture of the lung and you can see deep down in the lung, the white space here is the air. And there's a close connection with the blood, which is how air is exchanged. So uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide is exchanged. In this deep down spaces called the alveolus, there are two types of cells. There are the type one pneumocytes, which are flat and roughly 95% of the surface. And there are type two pneumocytes, which are more round. And there are only a small number of cells there, about 5%. It turns out that SARS coronavirus two infects these critical cells even though there are not many in the lung, they serve a critical function in keeping the air passages down there open. And so if you have COVID, you get these patchy infiltrates in the lungs. So how does it cause disease? It binds to this angiotensin converting enzyme, 
which is involved both in blood pressure maintenance as well as inflammation in these type two pneumocytes, as well as other sites on the body. So this is the virus a spike protein. It binds to this angiotensin converting enzyme two, which is on these type two pneumocytes. So how does it cause disease? It causes disease in two ways, by killing those cells and by reducing this angiotensin two enzyme that's on those cells. So severe COVID-19 uh, disease results from these cells not producing the material that allows the lung to breathe and gas exchange. And also because this protein is affected, you get late stage inflammation and fibrosis in the lungs. And also, as I mentioned, this protein is involved in blood pressure. You also get hemodynamic abnormalities. So this strikes at the very core of how we are able to exchange gases and also control our blood pressure. But as you know, there's also effects beyond the lungs. So there's, in, there's the cardiovascular system, as we mentioned. There's also in the intestines, it infects. Uh, the eyes can be involved in terms of transmission. Uh, there have been strokes related to clotting that have affected the brain. Uh, loss of sense of smell is very uh, uh, prominent in COVID-19, as well as liver and kidney uh, involvement with the late stage of the disease. So let's talk about some of the symptoms of COVID-19 uh, as compared to the flu. So you have fever, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, and very importantly, loss of smell as quite characteristic of COVID-19. The flu uh, tends to have fever and cough as well, but more upper respiratory tract symptoms and also generally more generalized symptoms. Uh, allergies are uh, very similar, but they have more the nose and the eyes with itchy nose, running or blocked nose and itchy red or watering eyes. Shortness of breath and loss of smell are very particular, uh, not unique to COVID-19, but very particular to COVID-19. Uh, viral load is a very important concept. What is viral load? It's the amount of virus that's in the environment. Uh, some people might think I get one virus, one virus particle and suddenly it's over. Uh, generally, we need to have about hundreds or thousands of virus particles to have uh, some sort of disease. So just being exposed to one virus uh, typically is not going to be uh, dangerous. How do we know this? Well, this is uh, the nasal swab test with PCR. And roughly speaking, it tells you that severe disease is seen when there's more virus around. And that's one reason why young people can also get severe disease. We saw the case of uh, the, the whistleblower doctor and many healthcare professionals who come down with the disease so viral load is very important. And so it's very important to minimize the exposure in terms of time, in terms of close spaces and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about how we fight back. So how do we fight back? There's a secondary response that is related to neutralizing antibodies that block this virus. As I said, the virus binds to this ACE2 protein, but if the antibodies can block it, it doesn't bind to the ACE2 and eventually is cleared from the body. So in general, we have what's called a primary response. If uh, we get an antigen, which is the uh, foreign uh, virus or bacteria, we get a relatively small primary response. If we expose to the antigen again, we get a very strong secondary response. So you see it's much greater here. So this secondary response is what we term, of course, immunity. So how to boost your immune system? Well, one of the most important things is to get enough sleep. Another one is to update your vaccines, seasonal flu vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine for older individuals. These are not vaccines for COVID, but they can help uh, minimize the other uh, aspects. You don't want to get the flu, for example. You don't want to get bacterial infections that can uh, overlap or, or cause secondary pneumonia. Healthy eating, uh, plant foods, yogurt, probiotics to improve the gut microbiome. Uh, decrease inflammation with less sugar, moderate exercise, managing stress, and take supplements in terms of hydration. Vitamin D is very important and a recommended dose of vitamin C. But as I mentioned, getting enough sleep is very important. So there are many vaccines possible out there. I'm not going to go into the details. The good news is that it's not a latent vac virus like a DNA virus. It's an RNA virus. So unlike HIV, there's a good possibility for a vaccine. The bad news is that like the common cold, the antibodies seem short-term. And also this virus mutates as we know. So we probably need a polyvalent multi-vehicle vaccine that 
is not just a single protein, but involves uh, multiple dimensions. And this implies a multidisciplinary, multi-company effort. Uh, Anti-vax sentiment would, could be a barrier. So many of the cities were talking about their prevention of a second wave. I think it's very important that cities also be thinking about vaccine education, public education, transparency, to prepare for when a vaccine will come about. Uh, there's been question about reinfection. I'm going to go through this very quickly. There are four possible causes of reinfection, redetection or reinfection. The most likely cause is repeat false positives with remnants of the RNA. These reinfected patients don't seem to be infectious. So what's the issue with antivirals? Remember I said the virus is not living. So antivirals cannot kill viruses because they're not living. So we're not going to ever have an antiviral like penicillin or a magic drug like that. So there are many possibilities for antivirals, but they, the key point is that they slow down the virus, allowing the immune system to function. So how does the virus spread? This is the green part. Uh, I'm gonna go two more minutes. Is that okay, Albert? Yeah, I'm going a little bit fast, but I, I think we'll be almost there. Two more minutes, talk about transmissibility. So the R0 is very interesting. The R0 is this number of people that are infected by a person on average. And this is two to 2.5. The actual number is the effective reproductive number, which uh, happens when some people start to get immune and also happens when uh, social distancing takes place. So what are the determinants of R0? There are intrinsic factors related to the nature of the virus. So the R0 might change with mutation. And there are extrinsic factors, such as the nature of the population, social distancing, you can see it's very crowded here, uh, and also uh, the, the, the infection producing contacts, so social distancing, and the mean infectious period. So there's an equation, and I apologize, a little mathematics here, but this R0 is related to the infection producing contacts, beta, and the mean infectious period, tau. And Many of the cities are talking about, for example, in Italy or with that uh, temperature app, et cetera, trying to reduce that time. And one of the reasons why Seoul has been so good is to reduce this tau, this mean infect infectious period. So catching people as early as possible, predicting outbreaks, using temperature and all these aspects, finding, isolating, treating infectious people quickly is very critical. So how is uh, the virus transmitted? It, there are several methods of transmission, direct, indirect, and vector. SARS, coronavirus 2, is probably direct with some aspect of fomites. For example, the Kupang outbreak we saw here was probably with some uh, surfaces that were infected. So uh, this is a very dangerous virus in that regard. There is some possibility of fecal-oral because the, the intestines can be infected. In fact, there's been talk of cities monitoring sewage systems to see if there are possible outbreaks occurring. So one, two, and three, the most important, of course, is person-to-person -person and droplets, prevent it with masks, fomites with surfaces, so the disinfection is very important, and the fecal-oral. Uh, in terms of droplets, we have what's called droplet precautions with masks and isolation, and we also need to know about contact precautions uh, with cleaning with soap and water, alcohol, bleach, hydrogen peroxide, on hands and surfaces respectively. So what are the primary mitigation strategies with these intrinsic factors? Well, there are four basic strategies, enforced lockdown, unenforced lockdown, voluntary social distancing, and minimal restrictions, herd immunity like in Sweden. So I feel that the best approach is this voluntary social distancing that we've done in South Korea. And there are four factors, intervene fast, test early, often, and safely, contact tracing, isolation, and surveillance, and enlist the public's help. And see, so these are some details around that. And I want to emphasize, here's that equation with the beta, which relates to infectious contacts, and tau, which relates to the timing. So these yellow are with the infectious contacts, uh, education, mass messaging, et cetera. And to reduce the time it are these early testing and fast testing. In Korea, the small things count. You'll notice this is a government office with hand wash. Masks are being given out. There's a plastic barrier here. There's cleaning of public spaces here at a bus stop uh, and fever checks uh, in many public places. Will there be a second wave? The historical example of the Spanish flu, 
Uh, SARS coronavirus is less virulent in the warm weather, but not completely. We've seen both Southern and Northern hemispheres. We see it in Brazil. There will definitely be a second wave if we don't have the right mitigation and it's highly infectious. There are three ways to test for COVID-19. There's the RNA test, the antigen test, and also the antibody test. Uh, the RNA and antigen tests say the person has the virus, so it's a diagnostic test. The antibody test says the person had the virus. It's a serological test. It's also important to note that there's nucleic acid tests, which are generally more uh, accurate, and there are protein tests, which are these blood tests, which are generally less accurate. So there's, there's no perfect test. Uh, uh, there has to be a combined strategy in this regard. Oh, last thing I just wanted to mention, testing alone is not important. Testing requires follow-up, contact tracing, quarantine, isolation, treatment. Just testing is not going to solve the problem. This may be common sense, but I think that's very important. It's testing and the whole package around that. So I'll end with a few more slides. What should be done? Uh, what should individuals do? The great majority of cases are asymptomatic. Cleaning and hygiene is very important. And that those messages need to be emphasized and the facilities encouraging that. Social distancing obviously is important. Wearing a mask in public spaces. And uh, these are not new measures. We saw that with the Spanish flu in, in 1918. And what should organizations do? Social distancing, uh, teleconferencing, minimizing contact, managing contacts, flexible scheduling, spreading out teams, uh, not the lunch hour at the same time, smaller teams cleaning, uh, and ventilation is very important as well. Encouraging the mental health is important, encouraging a positive supportive environment, obviously not holding hands here, but uh, other methods to encourage a positive environment. So what do we know about the virus? It is very tricky. How can we stop it only by destroying it or the immune system clearing it? How does it cause disease, the type two pneumocytes and disrupting the angiotensin II uh, enzyme, what are the prospects for a vaccine? Possible, but won't be easy. Can one be reinfected? Likely it's a false positive. How does one test for COVID-19? The three ways, RNA, antigen, and antibody. Do antibody tests work? Maybe immunity may not be absolute, so that's not necessarily something to 100% depend on. Does the virus mutate? Yes, but most uh, individually isolated in infected cases. Are ant effective antivirals possible? There is no perfect magic drug that will fix this, and we cannot anticipate it. So finally, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, before the Civil War, said, as our case is new, we must think anew and act anew. And indeed, my prediction is this crisis will inspire entirely new methods, diagnosis, treatment, management, etc. In fact, if we don't think anew or act anew, we will be forced to live with COVID-19 for the indefinite future. Thank you very much. Please take care. Uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn or via email. Sorry, I'm a little bit late. Thank you so much, Dr. Gorilla. And I don't think anyone is complaining. We all feel a little more like doctors ourselves, thanks to your presentation. Thank you received you. a lot of praise online. But let me now press you with a question to you. Sure. Uh, I saw that earlier you recommended uh, voluntary social distancing, or as some may prefer to call it, physical distancing, as yeah. the preferred method. But as you know, uh, herd immunity is still kind of a theory that we are not able to study the effects of until it's all said and done. And the, the possibility is that when this virus mutates, those people who have practiced herd immunity may now be past that hill, whereas those who have voluntarily socially distanced will now have to continue doing that and the question will be for how long. So how will we know, when will we know? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, that's an incredibly important question, very complex question, politically loaded question, ethical issues, in addition to the scientific issues, which we don't necessarily know about. So what I'm going to say is more my opinion. I, I, I think that the herd immunity, first of all, is not a preventative approach by definition. You will, this quote unquote herd immunity approach is not preventative because you're depending on people getting sick. People will die. And so uh, it is a strategy, but it is by definition not a preventative strategy. So that's a whole ethical issue, et cetera. Now, in terms of what you said is very quite valid, uh, countries that don't have the herd immunity essentially have their populations vulnerable 
but uh, we don't really know about the antibody protect protection. So the herd immunity group may have had a lot of people die because it wasn't preventative, as I mentioned. And all these people have antibodies, but they don't last very long or they're not very effective or the virus is mutated and those antibodies are not effective. In other words, it's a gamble. You're gambling in the present. In other words, you, people get sick and some may die or, you know, uh, as, as predicted. That's a gamble. And you're gambling on the future that that immunity that you've developed will, in fact, persist and be sustained. Uh, so I, that's why I think that that's a very dangerous strategy. Um, now, of course, it intersects with the whole economic issues. You know, how long do you distance? How long do you do the lockdown? Because, of course, economic issues lead to health, uh, uh, bad health as well. So uh, it's not such an easy equation. But I think, like Aristotle said, uh, the golden mean uh, to be the moderate approach the extremes can be difficult. I think that this, the physical distancing or the social distancing, however you want to phrase it, that South Korea has done is a compromise situation that I think uh, in that sense is, is the optimum. Maybe, you know, it's not ideal. Nothing is ideal, quite frankly, but is the optimum approach. But again, that's my opinion. Thanks so much for that insight. I want to go back to the private sector speakers. Dr. Marasso, are you still on with us? You are. Uh, I remember from your presentation that you were talking about um, a function that predicts new clusters. And uh, I'm wondering whether there could be the possibility for conflicting predictions, maybe based on others' data. And in such case, how do you then resolve that? And how do you then make a decision based on that? Uh, thank you for the question. So um, there are a number of ways to predict uh, um, new clusters, but uh, you, you know, with algorithms or artificial intelligence or some others, but um, uh, we decided together with the government to be very pragmatic and to base on uh, the real data, actual data uh, that we are collecting um, day by day. So basically, we once we have a, a new person infected, we are able to count how many people are nearby uh, within um, a certain uh, radius, which is defined by the by the government, and uh, we can we are able to compare the number of people which are infected around you, uh, around you meaning around where you are used to live, of course, because we are not tracking anyone with the mobile application for a number of issues, and we 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 are not going to 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 talk about this issue now, but. Uh, once you have a clear overview about the number of people infected around you, you can easily understand what will happen uh, person by person in the last days. And uh, you can easily understand if you're increasing or not and uh, how fast is increasing uh, the new cluster. And uh, once you can, uh, you can reduce to a single index this kind of information, the task force, the government task force, is able to understand every morning quickly if uh, new clusters appear on the scene on the scene and uh, <clears throat> after this information which is based on the result you can uh, easily understand that since you have the information geolocated if uh, there is something strange nearby can be a market can be a gym can be a school can be an hospital can be a number of things or can be a station and in this way you can hack on the field specific actions as the doctor mentioned before, only test is not the, 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 the winning strategy, but you need to combine all the things to protect people, to run tests, and to take care about the people infected. And uh, now, reopening for basically economic issues, the countries, we need to anticipate as soon as possible the new clusters, but mainly to understand why we have a new cluster in a specific place. If you can have this information in one day, two days, based on the trends, uh, the government can quickly react and can plan tests, some specific actions, or maybe close uh, a small portion of the city or the, or the neighbors in, the, and in this way to protect all the others. This is basically, and I'm open to share with you the way we are doing this in, uh, in two Italian uh, regional governments. Thank you, Dr. Marasso. And then lastly, uh, Mr. Georgiev, uh, I'd like to know what you think maybe is the new normal for businesses. 
especially businesses like yours, how do we then transition to the new normal? I mean, it's pretty much what we're doing right now. So I think everybody who is uh, doing business, uh, especially in South Korea, most of the people who are like based here know that it's a lot of personal contacts, a lot of, um, you know, meetings in person and like um, uh, maybe some like uh, work dinners. But the new normal is working from home and uh, doing a lot of online. So I think people who can adapt fast and uh, build up their skills will be uh, easier to, you know, to do uh, business in this new situation. Good way to look at it optimistically. Thank you to all of our speakers, to all of the audience that stuck around until the end. We did very well with time. I'm proud of everyone. Um, if anyone in the audience has questions still for any of our speakers, uh, anything that you want to work on with WeGo, uh, we are all here. Um, these are the speakers on the screen right now with their contacts. If you would like to get in touch with them directly, you are very welcome to do so. WeGo will actually be uh, collecting all of the uh, presentation materials that you saw today, and we will be releasing that on our website next week. Um, so do check online for that. We'll also have a recording of this webinar on our Smart Health Responder page, as we showed you earlier. And then, of course, uh, as, as you already know, this is just the first of a series of three to come. So two more, uh, one will be focused on the Americas, so North and South uh, America, and the other will be uh, focusing on Europe and Africa. So we're going to look at different regional aspects of this virus and how cities and the private sector have, have reacted to it and what they're doing now. And hopefully uh, in the months to come, we will see some more insights that we are not already aware of. The one for the Americas will take place sometime in late July and the one for Europe and Africa in late September. So more information will be given out as, uh, as our plans develop. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And we plan to send some information in mm. mid next month. So thank you again to all of you. Uh, uh, it was great seeing you. And uh, we'll see you again here on GoToMeeting and YouTube Live next time too.